Hey there, welcome to Autumn Afar, and welcome back to those of you who have joined me before. As always, any of the links that I've used as part of my research for this video are going to be linked in the description box below, and I encourage you to do your own research and form your own opinions. Today's video is going to be about some of the most famous resting places in the world. This video is specifically focusing on cemeteries, not monuments like Marc de Triomphe, for example, which is the resting place of eight unknown soldiers. Instead, we are going to look at places of rest that in some cases are massive, can't miss tourist attractions. This video is probably going to be one of the longest that I've done since it is the first of what I hope will be various holiday specials, and yes, Halloween is a holiday, so I am going to head across the pond to Europe first. So the first cemetery is in France, it's Cemetière du Père Lachaise, named after King Louis XIV's confessor, Father François Daille de Lachaise. This cemetery first opened over 220 years ago in 1804. It's home to over 70,000 ornate tombs across more than 100 acres, including those of Jim Morrison and Oscar Wilde. Some estimate that over 1 million people rest in this cemetery. To give you an idea of its location, it takes about an hour by metro, 30 minutes by car from the Eiffel Tower. Once you arrive, you may be shocked at what you find. Not unlike many cities and towns, this cemetery was planned out. It's on a grid. They even have road signs and block divisions. And just to prove it's really a tourist attraction, there are toilets near the main entrance. This is such a stunning space with beautifully ornately carved tombs and graves and cobblestone paved streets. Some say you need no more than two hours to visit, but in my opinion, if it's a nice day and I had the time, I may spend the whole day wandering rows of family tombs, admiring the artistry and craftsmanship, and maybe playing with some of the cats that like to hang out amongst the tombs. Next would be Highgate Cemetery in England, just north of London. The story of Highgate starts in 1839. The cemetery in the north of London, when it opened, well, London was having a lot of trouble. They had a staggeringly high mortality rate, and they were running out of places to put their dead. According to the Highgate website, burial grounds were anywhere there was space, between houses, taverns, and shops. The cemetery was private and created along with six others after an act of parliament was passed to open seven new burial grounds in the countryside for the burial of London's dead. They include Kensal Green in 1833, West Norwood in 1836, Abney Park, Brompton, and Nunhead in 1840, as well as Tower Hamlets in 1841. The grounds were purchased for £3,500 and were landscaped by David Ramsey, who was a renowned garden designer and landscape architect. The ground soon became one of the most fashionable burial places. It was so popular that in 1854, it was expanded, and the expansion opened in 1856. One of the most famous people to be buried here is Karl Marx, who died in 1883, and is now one of the most visited graves in London, which can be found in the East Cemetery of Highgate. That is not where the story of Highgate ends. At the turn of the century, the cemetery hit hard times. People stopped wanting ornate burials. Then the two world wars called up all the men who used to care for the grounds. And by 1960, the London Cemetery Company, which owned Highgate, had gone bankrupt. And slowly the cemetery fell into the hands of nature and in some cases, vandals. It's not all bad news though. After an attempt to get funding, buildings were sold in 1956 and the gates closed. A group was founded 15 years later in 1975, whose mission was to preserve this space. Their work has dramatically paid off since they started. They've been able to restore over 70 monuments so far in various areas, including a chapel interior that was restored in 2011 to its 1880 color scheme. If you plan to visit, make sure you check the schedule as they do close for funerals. They also charge a fee of four pounds as of recording this to help with restoration efforts. And the west side is only accessible by booking a tour. While not exactly a cemetery, Collegiate Church of St. Peter, more commonly known as Westminster Abbey, is easily one of the most visited places in London. Westminster has been the site of royal weddings, coronations, funerals, and many things in between. It also happens to be the resting place of 3,300 souls. Founded all the way back in 960, over 1,050 years ago, 
The building has been rebuilt and added onto a few times and is a stunning example of Gothic architecture. Westminster is not technically an abbey, but a royal peculiar which is exempt from the jurisdiction of the diocese and the archdiocese. Instead, they are under the jurisdiction of the monarch directly and has held this status since 1560, over 460 years and counting. Since 1066, all coronations of English royalty have happened here, along with 17 royal weddings since 1100. There are also more than 3,300 people buried here, including former prime ministers, poets, actors, scientists, monarchs, and military leaders. A few people you can visit include Jane Austen, Sir Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, Charles Dickens, Her Royal Highness Elizabeth I, and Edward V. Other than people buried, there are a few people memorialized at Westminster as well, like Martin Luther King Jr., as well as Charlotte, Emily, and Anne Bronte. Possibly more important than any of those is that Westminster is home to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. For those not familiar, there are several of these tombs around the world, including Canada, Australia, Italy, Japan, and the United States of America, which has five in various states. The one at Westminster, however, was the first. Now I'm going to move on to South America and the Cementiero de la Recoleta in Argentina. Named after the neighborhood in Buenos Aires that it's located in, the cemetery is built on the grounds of an ancient convent and church of an order of monks by the same name, who arrived in the area in 1732, after they disbanded in 1822, and the cemetery was founded on the grounds later that year, under the name Cementiero del Norte. It's been remodeled twice, first in 1822 by Prospero Catalin, a French engineer, then again in 1881 by Juan Antonio Pocchiazio, an Italian-born, Argentina-raised architect who aided in much of the modernization of Buenos Aires. The cemetery itself is massive, spread over 5.5 hectares, or 14 acres and being home to 6,400 statues, sarcophagi, coffins, and crypts. The cemetery is the final resting place of thousands. Some of the most celebrated Argentinians, including presidents, journalists, poets, and at least one former custodian of the cemetery who still haunts the grounds, and possibly most famous, First Lady of Argentina, Maria Eva Duerte de Perón more commonly called Evita. If you've seen any photos of the cemetery, you'll understand what I mean when I say that it is stunning. Much like Père Lachaise, there are some remarkable tombs and sculptures, but the cemetery is much more condensed with some crypts underground, inaccessible to the public. This cemetery is massive. If you want to visit, I would recommend finding a tour to make sure that you don't get lost and to learn more about the history and the people who are resting there. Now we're gonna take one last leap up to the North American continent where I've spent most of my time. I know I've missed a lot of other things, but I'm hoping to make a second follow-up video to this for any of the cemeteries in Africa, in Asia, and Australia because I know I've missed a lot, but this video is already pretty long and I would really like to do a second part, so it's probably gonna happen. Mexico is quite well known for their culture, especially that surrounding death. Even as a kid, I remember watching cartoons like Scooby-Doo referring to Dia de Muertos, which is what the beautiful state of Oaxaca is known so well for. While this stunning southern city of the same name is known for its beautiful green volcanic stone buildings from colonial times, as well as its stunning beaches, it is most famous for its indigenous culture. One of the most significant events of the year is Dia de Muertos, which lasts a few days, starting November 1st at midnight. The first day is a time where children are allowed to return, followed by the adults on November 2nd at midnight, and everyone coming back at noon on the 2nd to take part in the parade and other events. For those unfamiliar, Dia de Muertos, or Day of the Dead, is celebrated throughout Mexico and much of Latin America. It involves the gathering of friends and family to remember those who have died and to help them on their spiritual journey. While many may think it's a sad event, it's actually pretty joyous. In ancient times, death was viewed merely as another part of life and they continue to celebrate this way. 
I found a few sources who noted that at one point it was observed in the summer, but was moved to closer coincide with All Saints Day after the Spanish conquistadors and Catholic Church arrived. Though I wasn't able to find the original source for that information, I would be inclined to believe it, knowing how forceful Europeans were when they arrived in what is now Canada and various other locations around the world. The festival itself is incredibly beautiful, with everything from special foods, costumes, decorations, and even parades in some cities. This really is one of my favorite traditions from any culture. The idea of gathering with everyone I know and love, and playing cards, tidying the grave area, and talking about our dearly departed relatives just seems like something everyone should be doing already. Had in a local band playing music and it seems like a party most people would love to attend, especially when you see the stunning display put together with graves decorated with marigold flowers and lit by candles along with all the treats and offerings for sale for the spirits who've returned and maybe a few for the family still here to remember them. So we're gonna move up one more country to the United States of America. The next one is one that most people have probably heard of just because it is so prevalent. Located in Arlington, Virginia, the cemetery is home to over 400,000 souls. There are likely many things you don't know about one of the most famous cemeteries in the United States of America. The location is in itself a big part of the history of the United States. The main building, referred to as Arlington House, was once the home of Robert E. Lee, the famous Confederate general. For those of you not familiar, he was one of the Southern leaders, the side that ultimately lost the war, which is an integral part of the story. The property was actually passed down to his wife, Mary Lee, who was the only surviving child of George Washington Park Curtis at the time of his death in 1857. Mary had grown up on the property and raised her own children there as well, and even buried her parents on the property. The grounds were eventually won by the Union, the North. The grounds were seized after Mary Lee could not pay the $92 in property taxes, promptly or in person as she was extremely ill at the time, in late 1863. The government was the sole bidder in an auction in January 1864, offering $26,800, far under the estimated value of $34,100. In December 1882, the land was returned to the Lee family. After the Supreme Court ruled, it was confiscated without due process. Less than six months later, in March 1883, they sold the property back to the government for $150,000, which would now be equivalent to nearly $3.5 million. Both Mary and Robert E. Lee, who died in 1873 and 1870 respectively, are buried in the Lee family chapel, returned to the place they both loved so dearly. The cemetery now consists of an impressive 624 acres and still holds internments six days a week, holding up to 30 a day during the week and up to eight on Saturdays. The grounds are open 365 days a year and has over 3 million visitors every year. The cemetery is more than just a Civil War historical site. It also has a considerable number of monuments and grave sites to visit, including those of President John F. Kennedy and William Howard Taft, monuments to the space shuttles Columbia and Challenger, a memorial to Pan Am Flight 103, and the Canadian Cross of Sacrifice are also at the Arlington National Cemetery. Despite the fact that there are a number that I could have singled out specifically, I'm not going to for Louisiana because there are just too many to name. There are so many beautiful spaces to see in the state, specifically in New Orleans, where there are dozens of cemeteries that tour groups visit on a regular basis, the most popular of which were the St. Louis cemeteries, the Lafayette cemeteries, and the St. Vincent de Paul cemeteries, among others. They all have an incredibly rich history and are now located in residential areas, so if you want to visit, try a tour before going to visit on your own. The St. Louis No. 1 cemetery has an entrance fee of $20 for a tour that you must stay with a guide for. It's one of the most popular places to visit because it's the oldest in the city. Being founded in 1789, it's also the resting place of Marie Laveau, 
the New Orleans voodoo queen. Other notable individuals like Benjamin Henry Latrobe, an architect who died of yellow fever in 1820. It's also allegedly the final resting place of notorious slave owner Delphine LaLaurie, and eventually actor Nicolas Cage will be buried here as well. You can visit his tomb to be, as it's already been built. It's the pyramid one, because of course it is. Other than the famous names, one of the big reasons people flock to the graves of Nola is because of how unique they are. The graves are above ground because the city is below sea level and prone to floods. One interesting point is that many are oven crypts. They put the deceased person inside for one year and a day because they believe that's how long it would take for any illness or infection or infectious diseases to die. Then they would remove the coffin and the remains are pushed to the back of the chamber to reuse the crypt. Others have a shaft below for the same effect. Caitlin Doty with Ask a Mortician did a fantastic video on this, so I've linked that down below for you to check it out. And she's also got some really great video of the of the cemeteries in New Orleans, and I really highly encourage you to watch that video. It's really informational and it was very, very well done. I also want to talk a bit about the funeral tradition. The process of death in New Orleans is fascinating to me. When a person dies, it was at one point tradition to have a jazz funeral procession. These traditions are deep rooted in the community. Death to many symbolized a freedom they couldn't have in life. The procession was meant to not only help the deceased find their way to the afterlife, but it was also meant to celebrate their release from their earthly confines and suffering they face in life. These funerals caught on more in the mid-1900s. As time went on and costs rose, fewer people could afford what had become massive celebrations of the decedent. They became more common for fallen police officers, armed forces members, and influential individuals from the area. The tradition is to have the coffin carried, often by a horse-drawn carriage, followed by a brass band playing somber music and hymns all the way to the service of the church. Later, the somber music would continue to the place of burial. After the body had been placed into its tomb, or when they were away from the church, the music would slowly start to change. Along the way, people the procession passed were invited to join in the procession. This was known as the second line. The music would start to change to a joyous beat, giving release to celebrate to all those who had joined the procession offering to celebrate a life well lived, offering a cathartic release for those who had joined together to mourn. This would continue all the way to the reception with anywhere from with anywhere from dozens to in a few cases, a few thousand following. I think one of the most important, at least in my lifetime, was held in 2006 to commemorate the one year anniversary of Hurricane Katrina's devastation. Thousands gathered following a single empty coffin on a horse-drawn carriage to commemorate the souls lost. Many families had no body to bury, so being able to participate in such an important ritual likely offered them a sense of closure that they might not have otherwise had. So the last country that we are going to be looking at today as far as cemeteries is my home country of Canada. I'm going to start off with Notre Dame de Neige and Mount Royal Cemeteries here in Montreal. Notre Dame de Neige and Mount Royal Cemeteries have overlooked my home city since they were founded in 1854 and 1852 respectively. They share a sizable portion of Mount Royal, but they both have some unique features and incredible histories. I'll start with Notre Dame de Neige. If you figured the cemetery and basilica were run by the same people, you would be correct opened in 1854 to take on the growing need for a burial ground that the downtown St. Antoine Cemetery, near where Dorchester Square is now, the sprawling 113 hectare burial grounds are absolutely stunning. If you look past the occasional gravestone, it looks like a park. Inspired by the Parisian Père Lachaise Cemetery, the goal of the architects was to complement the classic French style with nature. The results are absolutely beautiful and earned the grounds a National Historic Site designation in 1999. There are about 55 kilometers of lanes on the grounds and over 1 million people have been laid to rest here. If you visit, you can see some of the 65,000 monuments 
and 71 family vaults, some of which belong to people like René Angelil, who was Céline Dion's manager and husband, politicians like Henri Bourassa, Robert Bourassa, Jean Drapeau, and beloved Montreal Canadian Maurice Richard. Mount Royal Cemetery is on the north side of the mountain and is a massive 165 acres. It's easy to get lost in the winding roadways throughout the grounds, which can be found on the cemetery's website. This cemetery offers historic walking tours and is an excellent place for bird watchers. There have been almost 150 species recorded on the grounds, making home in the centuries old trees. The grounds were once farmland and the cemetery replaced those that were closer to the city. It followed the American rural cemetery movement that saw cemeteries move out of the centers of towns and cities and into the surrounding areas. This was initially intended to curb overcrowding and to prevent the public health issues that central cemeteries caused historically. Mount Royal was also the site of Canada's first cremation. In 1900, crematoriums did not exist in Canada. So William MacDonald donated a generous sum of money to build the first one at Mount Royal, which opened in 1901 and started cremation in 1902. It remained the only cremation available in Quebec until 1975. And as far as I've been able to find, it's still operational. The reason it was the only one for so long was that though it would have helped save space, cremation was frowned upon by just about every religion. It wasn't until 1963 that the Vatican approved of cremation and not until 1966 when priests could perform ceremonies. Some of the people who are buried here include Prime Minister John Abbott, brewing tycoon John Molson, builder of Canada's first sugar refinery, John Redpath, Ogilvy's founder, J. Aird Nesbitt, Zeller's founder, Walter P. Zeller, as well as writer Mordecai Richler. So this is the last one on the list for today, and it's possibly one that you've never heard of, but probably should know about. Fairview, Nova Scotia is home to probably one of the most incredible cemeteries. Fairview, Nova Scotia is home to the cemetery of the victims of the Titanic. Of the 1,500 people who died in the tragedy, only 333 bodies were recovered. Of those, 121 are buried at Fairview. One interesting thing that I found while researching for this video is that there is a grave at Fairview from the Titanic that is marked as J. Dawson. However, the grave does not belong to Jack Dawson, but rather it belongs to Joseph Dawson, who was a coal trimmer. The 23-year-old would later be identified because of that union card. I also wanted to add that Fairview is the final resting place to a mass grave of the victims of the Halifax explosion of 1917. The explosion is estimated to have killed 1,950 people, including an estimated 500 children, but is thought to have killed many more. The blast leveled most of the port area and injured around 9,000 people, many of whom had injuries from cuts and scrapes to breathing issues due to smoke inhalation, as well as nearly 600 people with eye injuries from watching the disaster unfold. Many lost one eye, but records state that 16 people lost both eyes and approximately 40 went blind. The small cemetery has become a big attraction for both history buffs and Titanic fans alike. It's one of a few places to visit that has attachments to the Titanic disaster. Thank you again so much for joining me today. If you have any questions about what we talked about today or suggestions for future videos, you can leave them down in the comment section below. You can also connect with me across social media as at Autumn Afar. And in the words of Margaret Atwood, in the end, we'll all become stories. See you next time.